Hello and welcome. Today we're working on calculating the S&P 500 risk and return using a portfolio, using real data for the last 94 years. So let's get started. Hello, my name's Jeff from Finally Learn, where I help you finally learn financial literacy. So here's what I have, uh, our historical data going back from 1928 all the way through uh, 2021. So I've got 94 years of data. So here's the way it came, we're going to uh, spend a little time cleaning it up a little bit. These are all percentages. And so we have percentages for the S&P 500, which is the stock index. We have 10-year treasury bonds, U.S. treasury bonds, and three-month treasury bills. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to copy all this and move it to a different tab. So copy. And I'm going to calculate um, just a simple measure. And here, what we want to do is just a simple thing. Let's highlight the worst five years in red. So let's do it for the S&P 500. We can say, hey, we're really worried about risk. And so this is a function called conditional formatting. And so I can use the top bottom rules. So I can use the bottom 10, and I'm going to only pick five and put that in red. And what will happen is, the worst five years of the S&P 500, you see we have 1930, 1931, 1937. Well, three of those happened in the 1930s, but one uh, happened in 2008. We lost 37.5% in the S&P 500. Well, we can do this for all three. I'm going to uh, rename the S&P 500 stocks. I'm going to call the treasury bonds, bonds and the T-bills just bills. So just make it easy to read and, and we can use that name uh, later on. Now we can do the same thing. We can highlight the five best years in green. So let's do this. We, we're at the home ribbon, conditional formatting, and we can do the top and we pick top 10 and we only wanna do the top five and we wanna do this in green for good, I guess. So. Here we can see the very top five. Some of them happened in the 1928, 1933, so on. So we can see you know, what are our best years, what are our worst years. And so it looks like at the very beginning, we, uh, through the 1920s and 30s, we had more large uh, returns and more um, big negative returns. But what happens is uh, there uh, is a lot of risk in the stock market. We can do the same thing for uh, bonds and bills. We certainly can do that. I'm not going to show you on this one. You can do the same type of thing. Uh, one thing you can do is if you do conditional formatting, you can manage the rules. And so you have a top five rule, bottom five rule. You can copy and edit and put it in column C and column D, make it really easy. So let me try one. The top five, let's duplicate this. And so the top five, we not only want it for column B, we want it for column C. So let me highlight all this and hit OK. And we have the same, um, we have now have highlighted the top five for the bonds. So you can do that, manage that. So you have to do that two times for each column, the top five. Uh, in green and the worst five in red. Okay, now another way to think about it is let's I just set up a chart and we can work it together here. What if we have thinking about dollars rather than percentages? So let's say we have a beginning investment of a thousand dollars. Okay, and one thing I want to do is I want to put do it for all the years. So the very first year we have on this is uh, 1928, I believe. So 1928. So one thing we can do is we can copy this. Let's just copy it, copy, and then we'll put, uh, let's get started here. We have all the years, so we'll do it for 94 years, figure out the risk and return. Well, let's assume we have uh, stocks, bonds, and bills. Okay, let's do the risk and return for all of those. Now, the other thing I wanna do, because I'm gonna do several calculations, Let's highlight just the stock returns and let's name it. I'm going to do a named range, so I've highlighted all the returns. And then to the left of the formula bar, I'm going to name this stocks. 
And so now I can use that instead of the range, I can use the, the named range stocks. I'm going to do the same thing for bonds and bills. So I'll highlight every uh, bond return. I'm going to call it bonds. I'm going to do the same thing for bills. Highlight everything. And so we'll have uh, bills. So now I have three named ranges, stocks, which is that column, and then bonds, which is the, all the bond returns, and we have bills. Okay, so we have it all the way down uh, from 1928 all the way to 2021. Okay, so now we have stocks, bonds, bills. What would happen if we invested uh, initially in $1,000? So let me put um, here, in fact, let me add a, uh, one, one row here. Let me insert a row. All right, so we're going to say, well, what if we invested $1,000 in stocks? What kind of return would we have? And this is for 94 years. It's a long period of time. You can do it for 30 years or 50 years. I'm just using the complete data set so you can see how this works. So I made it where it was absolute and then copied across. We're going to assume we've invested at the beginning of 1928 $1,000. So what would happen? We'd have $1,000 times 1 plus whatever the return is in the stock market. Now we know this for the very first year in the stock market it's going to be 43.81% the very first year of our returns here that we have. So it's going to be 43.8%. So it'll return like $438 or whatever. So our answer is, is $1,438. Now I'm going to, it's bold. We don't need it to be bold. Um, it's dollar, but I'm going to get rid of the pennies. We don't need the pennies. Um, the numbers are going to be so large, the pennies are not going to matter. And so then I think we can copy this across for bonds and bills. So it looks like we got maybe a 0.8% return on bonds and maybe a 3% return on bills. Let's check. So 0.8 and 3%, that's how it works. Now we have the first year returns. And so what we want to do is do the second year and then we can copy it all the way down. So for the second year, we would say we have 1438 times, and then we'll put one plus the return, and it happens to be negative 8%. So we can say, well, that's 1319, and there's some pennies, I'm sure. So 1318 and 78 cents, we don't have to show the pennies. And we can copy this across, and we have 1319, uh, 1051, and uh, 1063. So you invested $1,000, and in two years, you'd have 1300 for stocks and, and 10,000, um, I'm sorry, 1,051, 1,063. Now, we should be able to take these and copy these all the way down. So I double click, send it all the way down. So let's see what we would have. Now, this is dramatic. If you invest in stock market, yes, there's big risk, but there is uh, returns over the long period of time are much higher. And so then you have, here's your stock return. If someone invested $1,000 at the beginning of 1928 and just let it um, invest in the S&P 500, that's 7.6 million. At, uh, if you did the same thing for bonds, you'd have 85,000, 1,000 turns into 85. So that's fantastic, but it, it pales in comparison to the, the uh, reward of the stock market. If you put it in just uh, treasury bills, that's like a savings account that's $20,000. Okay, so let's do some math on this and figure out what's going on. So we'll say, well, what is the future value? So we have this all the way down. So that's 7.6 million. That's one way to think about our future value here. And so let's copy it across. So here, one way to think about it is over 94 years, 1,000 grows into 7.6 million. Well, you could do $1 and figure out what that is. You could do it based on you know, $100. You could do it based on you know, $10,000. And the math works out to be the same. It's just easy to start maybe with 1,000. Now, what is the average return? The average return uh, is typically not the way we calculate um, how we do interest rates, but 
the average, just the average of those, those returns. So here's what I want to do. I want to take the average, and you can say, well, the average of stocks. The average of stocks, and remember, if we use stocks, then it's this entire column, all these years, and we add them up and divide by 94. So this is the, the mean and this is the average. Let me show you a, a little different way we can do this. Now, because we have a named range, we can just use average or stocks. Let me show you another little function I can build into the average function. There's a function called indirect, indirect, and I'm gonna to point to the name stocks. So what indirect will do is it'll say, by the way, indirect stocks, and it'll go and look if we have a named range called stocks, it will use that. And here's why the advantage of doing it this way. You've got the same return, 11.82, but I can now point to bonds and bills. So if I drag it across, I can do bonds and bills. So now I can see that this formula is pointing to bills. We have a named range called bills. And so it's an easy way to calculate and then be able to drag across. Otherwise, you'd have to type in stocks and then bonds and then bills. So the average return is 11.8 for stocks, a little more than 5%, 5.1% for bonds, and 3.3% for bills. So that's the average return. Now, the better way to calculate the annual return is called annualized return or the compounded annual growth rate the compounded annual growth rate, or CAGR. So here, we're going to use a little function. I'm going to use the function called RRI, or like a retire, required return on investment. So we're, I'm going to look for RRI, and what I need here is the number of periods. Now it's 94, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a count function of stocks. So how many stocks returns do we have, right? How many stock returns do we have? Well, I've got 94. I could type in 94, but I can let it count how many returns do we have. What is our present value? Well, our present value is 1,000. What is our future value? Our future value is uh, 7.6 million. In fact, I want to use the present value here, the 1,000. And so what we have is, we have something like 9.98% return. Now I can copy this across and what happens is I'm counting, I'm still counting stocks, that's not a big deal, it's still 94, uh, but I'm using the 1,000 above the bonds and I'm using the 85,000. So if 1,000 grew to 85,000, you have a compounded annual growth rate of about 4.8%. Bills, you have a compounded annual growth rate of about 3.28. So if you want to report these returns, this is the way that you would do it. This is the preferred approach. Now, what you'll see is the average return, just a simple mean, is always going to be a little bit higher than the compounded annual growth rate. So this is the way you report the return. So you could say, hey, the stock, over 94 years, the stock has returned about a 10% return. By the way, that includes dividends. So you've got about a 10% return. Now watch, a 10% return yields dramatically different results than a 4.8% return. The returns about double, but um, the future value is way, way exponentially larger, not just double larger. It is way, way larger. Now, so we talked about the returns. This is the good stuff, right? Well, let's talk about the risk. So one of the ways we measure risk is through standard deviation. So we're going to use uh, standard deviation. So let's uh, use, I use the FX to use my formula builder. So I'm gonna look for standard deviation. So if I start typing in standard STD, then you can see all these different standard deviations. I'm gonna use the standard deviation of the sample size of, of the sample here. And I wanna do uh, for stocks, so I can use the indirect function. I could just type in stocks and it'll work, right? So let me show you stocks. And then we're gonna get like a 19.4%, you see this? But I want to do it one step more so I can copy it across. I don't have to edit those next two. I'm going to say indirect, uh, not, not stocks, but pointing to the word stocks. 
close parentheses. And so what I have, remember, 19.8 or 19.4 rather. So what I have is this is going to be a percentage. So 19.46 is the standard deviation, bonds and bills. So what you see here, here's how you read it. Stocks are, are much more risky in terms of volatility than bonds and bills. And so you would say, yes, there's more risk, but generally in finance, one of the basic rules is it's hard to have more return without adding risk. And so risk and return go together. Now, it doesn't mean if you increase your risk, you're guaranteed to make more money, but that's a principle. If you take no risk, you're over here taking no risk, then you have uh, really no returns, very, very little returns. All right, another way to think about the risk is, well, what's the five worst years that you might have? The five worst years you would have uh, in terms of the, the returns. Okay, so we're going to use a function called uh, small. So I'm going to start with small. I'm going to go to my formula builder here. Type in small. All right, what do I need? I need an array. So we can do the array like stocks. And I'm going to point to the one. Okay, so the absolute worst year is 43.84%. Now, I want to copy it across and I want to copy it down. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to replace these stocks with the indirect and point to stocks. Now, as I copied across, I want it to move from stocks to bonds to bills. But as I copy it down, I want to stay on stock. So here's what I want to do. I want to keep it. So if I use my F4, I don't need it to always stay at stocks. I'm happy for it to move to the right to bonds and bills. So I need, um, it can move from column G to column H to column I, but I do want it to be in row 10. So I want it to move stocks, bonds, bills. So I'm going to close parentheses here. Now for um, this one, I want it to move down, but not across. So for the F4 here, I'm going to point to this again. So F4, I want it to be in the column F, but it doesn't have to be in row 15. It can move 15, 16, 17, 18, so on. So now I've got the same answer, but if I copy it down, you see I have the five worst years in stocks. And let's now copy it across, and I'll have the five worst years in bills. So let's look at what we have. Let's uh, compare our results. It's saying small bills, what's the smallest uh, return for bills, and what's the fifth smallest return for bills same thing. So in a little quick way, we, we showed you how to do. Um, this is a doing mixed address because we want the column or the row to be uh, absolute and, and uh, fixed. And we want the, the other one to be relative. So this is a mixed address rather than absolute or relative. All right, so here's how we can think about about the stock market. Yes, there's, there is more risk. We see this, there's more risk. You have to survive a 43% loss one year, a 35% loss one year, but the returns over a long period of time, now you can do this for 20 years or 30 years or whatever, and the answers come out to be very similar. There is more risk in the stock market, but there's more returns over a long period of time. All right, so I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching, we'll see you on the next video.